first we would like to welcome our professor, Rebecca Heinrichs, uh, who's going to discuss U.S. nuclear deterrent and the military buildup of our adversaries. Rebecca is a senior fellow at Hudson Institute, where she provides research and commentary on a range of national security issues, specializing in nuclear deterrence, missile defense, and counterproliferation. All very timely these days. Uh, Rebecca served as an advisor on national security and foreign policy to Representative Trent Franks of Arizona, a member of the House Armed Services Committee, and helped launch the Bipartisan Missile Defense Caucus. She has testified before Congress and has presented to numerous organizations, including the Aerospace Industries Association, the Reserve Officers Association, the National Defense Industrial Association, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and for the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. She holds an MA in National Security and Strategic Studies from the US Naval War College. She also graduated with highest distinction from the College of Naval Command and Staff, receiving the Director's Award for Academic Excellence. She received a Bachelor of Arts degree from Ashland University in Ohio and graduated from the Ashbrook Scholar Program. At IWP, she teaches a course on nuclear deterrence and arms control. Welcome, Rebecca, wherever you are. Well, good morning. I, um, I asked if I could just speak for a short time and then turn it over to have a discussion with you all because there is so much going on in the world. Um, and so I'm happy to discuss what it is that you would like to focus on. I'm not an expert in all of it, but I have an opinion on most of it. <laughs> it's been the case for a long time. Well, it is truly a pleasure to be with you all this morning. Um, I, am, I am deeply grateful to the Institute of World Politics for the opportunity to be associated with such a wonderful institution. I, I gave lectures at IWP before I came on as faculty, and so uh, it, was, it was really just a, an honor to be asked to, to draft my own syllabus and to teach a course on something that is so critically important to me, which is uh, American nuclear deterrence and the nuclear umbrella that we extend to, to so many allies, which um, I know I'll have people ask me, why in the world did you get so, um, I'm from a small town in rural Ohio, and, and people ask me, why did you get so interested in nuclear weapons and nuclear deterrence? And the more I studied uh, the American founding, the more I fell in love with what our country is, the more I had a strong desire to do something in defense and international relations that would uh, extend this great American experiment in self-government. And, and so I, I was interested in international relations. I was a freshman in college when September 11th happened. Um, and so then I, I became um, highly motivated to do something specifically in security. And the more I studied, the more I became persuaded that really the backbone of what we mean when we talk about American military preeminence, America's role in the world, we're talking about the, the, the most powerful weapons that human beings have, have um, created that really is the backbone of everything else we do militarily, how we can extend our power, our power projection throughout the world, and it's our nuclear weapons. And so that really is the backbone of what we talk about when we talk about American military preeminence and uh, the US-led order in Europe, the Middle East, um, and in Asia. And so that is where my interest came. And so it was it's a great honor to be able to teach at the Institute of World Politics on this study. I have had wonderful students come through who are um, intuitively very highly motivated to, to understand this complex subject, some of which about a d d deterrence is, is not intuitive and takes a lot of serious study, especially when culturally so much of the commentary is about nuclear disarmament and not what uh, nuclear weapons have contributed to peace and security and uh, the prosperity and security of, of, of the American people. 
And, um, and, and this brings me to another point of, of why I uh, was drawn to IWP and why IWP is so special, is it's not even just that, that the United States should be strong. There's something, there's something about the United States that, that is different and, 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 and makes it worthy of this great power and responsibility. Now, you, know, at, at, you, you may know there's generally two frameworks in international relations. There's the idealist framework, which believes that there's sort of these anthropological assumptions about people that were naturally good, um, and that uh, therefore nations uh, can get along if we can just simply set aside our arms, we can have treaties, negotiations, we can really kind of uh, work together in, in through the UN and through other international institutions such as that, and that we will progressively become more peaceful as we move towards this um, this world order that is more harmonious. And, and that is the idealist school of thought. Realism, in contrast, sees things as it is. We look up and we see a competitive anarchic world. We see countries that might be peaceful or partners for a while, and then something else happens and they are no longer partners and allies. We see uh, countries that have long memories and long, long, long grudges um, that, that remain adversarial for, with, against other countries for a long time. And we see countries that have different systems of government, different things um, about their national character that motivates them to, to pursue various national objectives that are, in, that are incompatible with, with US interests and the interests of our allies. And, and so, IWP uh, holds up this idea right on the website. The Institute of World Politics is a graduate school of national security, intelligence, and international affairs dedicated to developing leaders with a sound understanding of international relations and ethical conduct of statecraft. Based on knowledge and appreciation of what? The founding principles of the American political, political economy and the Western moral tradition. So some people would say, ah, if you care about the ethics and morality in international relations, that stuff, that stuff is unserious. You're either a realist, which means you deal with power politics, or you're an idealist and you have these ideas about morality and ethical conduct. No, no, actually, IWP is correct in understanding that nations act as themselves. They have their own particular character and behavior. It's why the Russians have a different risk assessment and a risk toleration about nuclear weapons than, than the United States of America and our NATO allies. It's why the Chinese Communist Party treats their people so differently than the way we treat our own people. And that has an impact in how they be, move and behave in the world. It's why a Chinese Communist Party-led order would be very, very different than an American-led order. These things matter, and it's not ideal. It's actually the most realistic, the most the, 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 a, a true and proper view of realism in international relations takes into account the national character of every other nation as well as your own. And so you must understand your own country and how uh, our principles and priorities and how that motivates and informs our interests, yes, and then how we actually conduct ourselves in the world. And so it is, it is of enormous importance that the mission of IWP continue to prosper, to educate students, um, to think about this thing th th this way carefully, to analyze how to do this well in various um, uh, areas of study as it applies to international relations. Okay, so getting to the, the, the threat that we face today, the global threat environment, I don't have to tell this, this, this um, group of people, it is far more complex. The, the threat environment is far more complex than the one that I was born into. In the last 40 years since the Cold War, we keep hearing senior military leaders talk about how our threat environment is much more complex. Russia's economy, though small in comparison to other nations, more comparable to some of our largest states, pours its resources into what? Into its military, and not just its military in general, into advanced capabilities specifically to counter the United States and Europe, across all military domains, space all the way down. And it has invested heavily in its nuclear weapons. The United States 
since uh, the early 90s. We've divested of certain types of nuclear weapons. So whenever you think about who's the, who's the most advanced nuclear power, depends on how you're going to actually look at those metrics and, and quantify that. The United States, of course, and the Russian Federation still are by, abiding by the, the New START Treaty, or the, the New START Treaty, I should say, is still in place. We don't know about the Russians in some respects because they have not permitted us to do standard verification since uh, the coronavirus pandemic and then now with their uh, war of aggression against Ukraine. But the United States has not invested in theater range nuclear weapons, the Russians have. It's not much hyper of a hyperbole to say that if the Russians created a, uh, a weapon system for in theater, they put a nuclear weapon on it, or they gave it the capability to do that. Politico reported today that the, the US government has now, um, it's interesting to see which things the, the, the Biden administration is sharing with the press, but essentially we, we, won't, we won't have a really big heads up on when the nu when, if the Russians um, deploy nuclear weapons or are about to employ a nuclear weapon in, in Ukraine and Europe because they made so many of their weapon systems dual capable to put conventional weapons or nuclear weapons on them. That's by design to make it difficult on their enemy to understand what they're about to do. So the United States has essentially tried to lead the world down to this path of nuclear zero, um, divested of theater nuclear weapons, pursued arms control, all things that are well and good, as long as the United States maintains a robust and credible nuclear deterrent. So when President Obama negotiated the New START Treaty, the Republican Senate said, we will ratify this treaty as long as you certify that you will modernize the nuclear weapons that we have remaining, our nuclear triad. And President Obama said that he would. And so that is what we have today. We have a robust, we have a, we have a nuclear de de deterrent based on this triad, but we do not have the same numbers. I mean, that, that Russians, most, the most recent, I think, open source documentation says the Russians outnumber US theater range nuclear weapons 10 to one. Now, China's economy is massive, smaller than ours still, but depends on who you ask. But it too has poured resources into its military. Really, you think about Xi Jinping, you know, people say, or, and the Chinese Communist Party has been hiding, biding their time, being patient with what their national objectives are, not their intent. But really, you can tell it's really since... Um, uh, the 80s, they've really been, and then in the, in the 90s, they've watched the United States uh, conduct uh, military operations in the Middle East, and they've been learning about the American way of war, and they've been studying it, and they've been investing in the kinds of weapon systems specifically designed to push the United States out of the Pacific, yes, but not just the Pacific. Xi Jinping has been very, very clear about his global ambitions, and it is to supplant the U.S.-led order. So it, just like the Russians, have poured their, their money into specific kinds of technologies, advanced technologies across all military domains, of course, again, space all the way down. The United States has been more hesitant to do things like pour money into uh, military operations and planning for the space domain, um, hoping that space can remain a place um, that is not militarized, that is... Um, you know, the, it's the heavens and we're going to try to sort of limit the thing, the limit, the, the means in which we prepare for warfare and that space should remain um, uh, free from that. Our, our adversaries, again, looking back at those national characters and their intent have not um, held those same beliefs and have moved forward very aggressively for military applications in space. And making matters worse, China and Russia are getting closer together. If you even asked people five years ago, six years ago, seven years ago, what do you think about the Chinese Communist Party cooperating with the Russian Federation? And many people would immediately say it couldn't happen. There's too many, there's too many conflicting interests between the two powers. They're too different. Um, the Chinese Communist Party would want to dominate the Russian Federation. The kinds of things that Russia wants to do wouldn't be compatible with the, with, with the Chinese Communist Party. And yet, and yet, Two countries so highly motivated in their own corners of the world, so highly motivated to, to undo, to weaken, yes, but to undo the U.S.-led order in their respective regions. 
And so they have found this, this opportunity together to collaborate. And you can see just day by day um, with a, a new public reporting of new and amazing ways in which those two countries are cooperating. You know, I like to see, that, uh, some, and some analysts are still having a hard time, not IWP analysts, some, some analysts are still having a hard time wrapping their mind around this. Um, I, I, I hear, I see commentary and I hear people saying, oh, you know, China's gonna have buyer's remorse about how badly the Russians um, have, have done in Ukraine. They're, being, they're becoming, you know, even more international prize than they were previously. It has not stopped the Chinese from massive joint military exercises with Russia. It has not caused China to publicly um, uh, disassociate with the Russians. In fact, the, the two leaders, Putin and Xi, are still very publicly uh, defensive of one another's claims, China as against uh, the de our democratic um, ally, Taiwan, and, and the Russians' erroneous claims about territory in Ukraine, but not just Ukraine. Remember, Putin is very clear again about, about his intent, and he makes claims where there are ethnic Russians in sovereign territories that do not belong to Russia. So there, right now we're talking a lot about Ukraine, um, but, but uh, his claims are much more expansive than just the, the physical territory, sovereign territory, territory of, of Ukraine. So, the, so China and Russia are continuing to collaborate um, a, a, a across different areas. And so you cannot talk um, realistically, you cannot talk realistically about how the United States should approach this without understanding what their mission is. And then you have to examine what the U.S. interests are in these areas. There, is, there are real serious concerns um, domestically in the United States about what our interests are in Europe. What, are, what does it mean anymore to have a U.S.-led order in Europe? What are our interests? Um, what are our interests in Asia? And so this is something that I talk with the students about and I bring up in class. We spend a lot of time in class even just talking about what we mean when we say U.S. interests. A lot of organizations can just gloss it over, U.S. interests. Let's talk about that. We, the United States, have been happy for Europe to prosper. It has strengthened allies, spurred innovation, strengthened security through intelligence sharing, collaboration in the military sphere, benefited Americans economically through higher standards of living. Our shared history with our European cousins has fostered alliances worthy of the slog of diplomacy as we have mutually benefited. European foreign direct investment in the United States totaled $3.2 trillion just last year. I had an Ohio, again, I'm from the small town of Ohio. I had an Ohio paper um, newspaper call me and say, you know, what do we tell what do we tell Ohioans about what our interests are in Ukraine? And I said, go up, look up, look up, and see what America, what Ohio farmers export. Look what Ohio farmers export. Look at what they import. Import. What about machinists? This we 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 are to a point where we, we've got some. We are overly reliant on supply chains in China. Well, we're going to have to look elsewhere. It's very, very wise to try to get as many of our critical supply chains back in our own sovereign territory. We are not going to be able to move fast enough to get it all here. It's not realistic. We, we, that's why I tell people it's not just reshoring, it's friendly shoring. We've got to get it to countries that are going to help us in this major power competition with an adversary that is deeply antithetical to the American way of life and, and, and the West, which means we're going to need our European friends. Now, that does not mean that the Europeans get to dictate to the United States how things are gonna go while they're so reliant on American security guarantees. And that's where tough diplomacy comes into place. It's not one or the other. I hear people say, the Europeans are too, you know, they take advantage of us, so we should pull out. No, it is American interests and the interests and the security of my children that motivates me to want the Europeans to do their part to be strong sovereign nations and to contribute to upholding and defending the West. And so that's why it's, you, you, you need tough American diplomacy uh, to make sure that our allies are doing their part. And we have seen great progress. We saw great progress in the last administration, and we, saw great, we, we continue to see progress, especially with the Eastern Front NATO allies, the Balts, the Poles. I was recently in Warsaw speaking with the Poles um, about this. These are very motivated people to do their part to hold the front line against Russian imperialism. They are worthy allies, and they deserve Americans to make good on the commitments we've made to them. 
The Chinese Communist Party's aims to supplant the United States might begin with getting a stranglehold over Asia, but that is not where their ambitions end either. We have close allies in the region as well, the Australians, the Japanese, the South Koreans, and yes, Taiwan. And none of them want to be under the heavy hand of the Chinese Communist Party. This, this really came to head with the Australians during the COVID pandemic, and they are still suffering under sanctions from the Chinese gov government because of Australia's merely insisting that we understand the origins of the coronavirus. They are still under heavy-handed sanctions from the Chinese government. There's 14 points that the Chinese have said to the Australians that the Australians have to do in order for China to relieve the sanctions. I believe nine of them have to do with Australia's domestic politics, none of which have anything to do with the way the Australians treat the Chinese. Broadly, the United States has not done as well in investing in the kinds of military capabilities to defend its place in the world. Not since the Cold War. We've gotten too comfortable and we've put too much hope on trade actually glossing over all of these differences that I said are so important to understand and grapple with. We thought Republicans and Democrats believed that if the Chinese Communist Party was welcomed into the economic, um, in, in, into the international economic system, that they would become more liberal, that they would uh, abide by our way of doing things, they would be transparent and fair in trade and commerce in things like global health, that they would abide by the US and the West's way of doing business. That is not what has happened. The Chinese Communist Party has been quiet, has increased its wealth, and is now determined to use uh, the, their wealth to put into their military to push the United States out, and in doing so, have the ability to affect international institutions to favor it and its interests against the United States. And despite the misinformation we hear constantly on TV, the United States and NATO has only attempt, uh, the, the United States and NATO has now worked, yes, to handle Russia, but now they are growing, they are growing increasingly I'm appreci uh, appreciating the threat that the Chinese Communist Party actually poses as well. One of the best countries I think that is leading the way for Europe right now is Lithuania. Lithuania has understood the problem of China and the, and the problem of Russia, uh, maybe better than anybody um, in, in Europe, and, and is uh, really punching far above its um, weight class, and it's, and it's, it's inspiring. Um, but, but they understand the connection between the two. Our new Italian prime minister has been talking about the Chinese um, threat and the Russian threat um, for a while, and the connection between the two and the need to defend the West against the, their authoritarianism. So what do we do now? I'm going to end on this cheery note, and then I'll turn it over. The Biden administration has really tried to go from crisis to crisis to crisis since it came into office. I began with the Afghanistan withdrawal, the precipitous withdrawal, in which it shook our allies and partners, confused as to what the United States is doing. It's not just that the United States wound down what we were doing there. It was the way the United States withdrew from Afghanistan. Now it's seeking a nuclear deal with the Iranians, while the Iranians are in the middle of one of the most inspiring and heart-wrenching um, protests where uh, women in particular have had enough. Um, and yet the, the Biden administration is still so desperate for an Iran deal that would be far worse than the Obama administration's Iran deal, would flood the regime with cash that they would use immediately to carry out their terrorist activities throughout the region and trying to push the United States um, their, and our influence um, out of the region, and of course, obviously, would greatly threaten our um, closest and most important allies in the region, the Israelis. And the Biden administration failed to deter the Russian Federation from invading Ukraine. N nuclear employment, the risk of nuclear employment doesn't just happen sort of out of the blue. That's not the most likely way it happens. It happens because you fail to deter a major war on the lowest levels of conventional escalation. Once you fail to deter that, then you have to work very hard in intra, intra war deterrence to try to keep it for, on the lower levels of escalation. It has been my view that the Biden administration has been so risk averse and so afraid of the highest levels of violence that they have ceded escalation control to the Russians. And so you continue to see the Russians, you see tactical victories from the Ukrainians, which is wonderful, 
but short-lived, and then the Russians continue to, to, to further escalate. And that's how you get to the precipice of nuclear employment. It's a warning. It's just a warning. To get out of this cascading series of crises, and meanwhile, the Chinese are watching everything that the Russians do. They're learning about what the United States can and cannot, you know, will and will not do. And what I'm afraid is that the Chinese Communist Party has learned the worst lesson they can learn is that, that the United States is intimidated by nuclear saber rattling. We are so intimidated by nuclear saber rattling, and part of it, part of it is going to be specific to whoever the president of the United States is at the time. He or she is going to have their own risk tolerance. But it's not just that. You also have to have the military capabilities at the disposal for whoever the president of the United States is, so he is confident that he can move in the world on terms most conducive to American interests. We have divested of the kinds of weapon systems that we would be able to hold confidently to convince the Russians that if you do this, we have the capability to make you regret that decision. Furthermore, if you don't regret that decision and you continue to escalate, we will keep going until you understand that you will not prevail. So we must rebuild our military industrial capacity. We must. We must have the ability to produce weapons at scale. We can see what's happening in Ukraine. Now we need to get to the same kinds of weapons we're selling to Ukraine. We need to get them to Taiwan. How do we do that? We have to have, we have, to have the ability to produce these weapons at scale. Number two, lean hard on our alliances. Rewarding good behavior even as we insist they do more. It's not, we can't just, can't just put, uh, you know, it's not just sticks that we need with our allies. You reward those small countries that are doing well handsomely so that you cause these other rich countries to understand that there's also great benefit um, in, in working with the United States. Number three, we must have a modern nuclear deterrent and we should leverage the best technology American ingenuity offers to be able to make sure that we can successfully deter um, our adversaries who are increasingly willing to lower the nuclear threshold and think about wh when they might actually um, employ a nuclear weapon um, in battle. In closing, we cannot be in reacting mode. And we should refuse the fatalism of both the right end of the political spectrum and the left of the political spectrum that believes that America is just in decline and that it cannot be helped, or even worse, that we don't deserve it. We are the heirs and heiresses of a grand experiment in self-government, a nation with a sometimes clumsy record of wielding power, but a great, great nation. And by God's grace, a good, a good nation based on principles that are good and are worthy of protecting. And with good and great citizens who are um, the next generation. And so that is the mission of the IWP. It is a great honor to be associated with such a wonderful and timely organization uh, doing great work to, to educate the next generation of individuals who will go out then um, in, in the American government and sometimes our allies' government um, to, to work with us towards this great mission. Thank you. <laughs>